great because I imagine we'll have a lengthy discussion today. Um, uh, I'm Eva Rupito. I'm uh, the interim chair for the equity committee, so thanks everybody for coming today. Um, yeah, we'll just go around the room. In here? Yeah. I'm Emily Berry. I look at infant and services and support for healthy families and equity children. My name is Sadie Fiber. I work at Western Network and I'm the director of the Chocolate Center. Carol Collingwood, the Living Care Director of Early Learning. Sue Parrish, Health Partnerships Manager of Early Learning Division. Denise Swanson, Health Partnerships Manager of Early Learning Division. Andy Mashburn, Associate Professor of Psychology at Oregon State. David Mandel, Acting Early Learning Director. Bobby Rebel, Oregon State University. Plum George, Research Early Learning Division. We have somebody listed as caller one on the. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? No. Hi, this is Linda from the South Central Early Learning Hub. Okay. And Debbie Jones? Yes, this is uh, Debbie Jones. I'm a prevention specialist from Wasco County and also on the Four Rivers Early Learning Hub. Great. Thanks for joining us. I think that's all we have so far, but I'll try to catch people as they join and have them introduce themselves. Um, so um, I guess we'll just move along to uh, having the Measuring Success Committee share the work. Does make sense? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what this says number one. Yeah, <laughs> this number one, and oh, we have a, another person joining us. Right, we're going to put you on the spot and have you introduce yourself. Of course. Hey, I'm Jen Madison. I'm with the Report Foundation. Great. Thanks for joining us. Did you want to say something though before, like the point of having the joint meeting? Or, oh, or, you know, sure. Since this is our mix of the day. Yeah. Our mix of the day. Yeah. Oh, there is coffee. If you don't like coffee, uh, there's tea right across the hall in the kitchen. Um, it's the tea bags are right above the sink, and there's a uh, hot water dispenser too. So feel free to help yourself. Um, and yeah, the, the coffee is fully caffeinated. So um, <laughs> and really hot. It nice, feels nice and cold. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's why that's why I have hot tea too. Um, just mostly full warmth. Um, so thanks for everybody for joining today. Um, I, we thought it would be really good uh, to have both uh, subcommittees meet and uh, go over uh, work. Um, the equity committee has the equity lens, and while everybody should be versed in it and have you know have familiarity with it, we thought it would be good to start having dual conversations. Um, between various committees and groups and the equity committee to make sure that the lens was being applied and to uh, be able to bring out any questions and you know so that we could have those conversations before things needed to be implemented um, instead of during implementation. So that's kind of uh, why we're all together today. So I'm really looking forward to learning about the work I'm, and uh, yeah. Do we have any questions or new to this? Nervous. I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So is the manager uh, task for the day to go through the measuring success report with an equity lens, or is it more uh, broader? Hey, go ahead. So I, I think it's sort of twofold. Is one, you know, and um, actually use Mixer intentionally. I think, you know, just as, um, it's, I think it's an opportunity to help us identify where there's really important intersections in our work, um, particularly the places as the Measuring Success Committee, you know, has its, has its charge and work plan where it would really be good to get input um, from this committee um, and then also to help Measuring Success Committee understand what the role of the equity implementation committee is and what it's working on. Um, as a sort of point of where it seemed like, you know, since this is sort of a first meeting where there might be a real opportunity, and also given where 
the Measuring Success Committee is in its work plan. It seemed like the key policy questions that the Measuring Success Committee has been working on might be a good place to start a conversation. So. <laughs> So those who the uh, measuring sex need to share current work. Is this this document, the policy questions or um, but you know, I think that was one of the pieces that we wanted to get input on. Um, but I think it might just I can Why don't you take over you. now and just yeah. tell us <laughs> how you want to uh, do your measuring success part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well I, you know and I think we sent out both the charter and yes. the work plan to the um, to this committee uh, in advance. Um, and I don't want to do all the talking, so people should just join and to you know jump in and correct me or add amendments. Um, <laughs> okay, but um, the the measuring success committee was created by the early learning council. Um, Really, last well, at the beginning of this year, um, and it formally got launched in June. But it was it was created with the idea that so much of the council's focus and the focus on the early learning and on the early learning system transformation um, is really on this idea of how do you use shared measures to drive the kinds of change that we all want to see um, for the early learning system. Um, but I think also with a deep acknowledgement of the challenges around data and data systems, um, and also um, the challenges and the need for subtlety in using data around accountability and performance measure. Um, um, so the idea was to have a place that was really looking holistically across the early learning system, but also a committee that would have the opportunity to dive into some of the deeper and work that we knew that was pretty pressing around um, um, data and performance measures. So we've been trying as a committee to balance both that high level look um, with also some of the more for lack of a better word, kind of task-oriented work that we also need to be doing. So to be honest, a lot of our time, and I think this will be sort of true through the, through the rest of this year and next year, um, has been around um, uh, hubs, hub incentive metrics, and hub metrics more generally. So when the Early Learning Council um, allocated resources to the hubs in July of 2015, they held back some of those funds for um, to be tied to to be incentivized and tied to performance measures. I hate the word incentivized. Um, <laughs> so when the metric when the measuring success committee was formed, that was um, and had its first meeting in June. That really was one of the first key agenda items, and it's um, I think uh, the committee's been doing really great work. Um, but it's also pretty challenging given the state of metrics and data and where the hubs are to develop and to figure out how to do that meaningfully. And the committee's brought some, brought some preliminary sort of principles and structures for that um, to the council meeting in September. And we'll be trying to finalize those recommendations before the council meets in October, although um, it's getting really, really soon. So that's, that's been just one of the most pressing and challenging pieces of work. Um, but, we've all, but, we've, but what we've also been trying to do is sort of take a look at some high-level key policy research and evaluation questions that we think we ought to be asking across the early learning system. And you know, you know, so what we've been doing with like, all of our meetings is sort of doing, starting with that high-level look and going through these, these policy questions and then sort of doing that sort of deeper dive into the hub incentive metrics. Um, but we thought that before we went too much farther, that these high-level policy questions, with the goal that these would be questions we'd be asking across the system and in particular programs as well, um, would be just a great place to start this conversation with this committee. RBG, as a council member on that committee, do you want to add anything or any other measuring success? Yeah. 
and the numbers. So far, so good. Yeah, I just think we have this big, big, big idea, and we have a little too many steps. <laughs> you know, like we get to talk about, you know, and somehow holding their close of proof. Yeah, that there is a long-term, really, really big um, goal about <clears throat> monitoring or being accountable, or, you know, in a constructive way that continuously improves what we do. And when we've got on our plate some really concrete things that are needed there too. And I think one of the things the committee has as one of its aspirational goals that's sort of related to what we've been talking about is how do we also have a coherent shared vision across the early learning system, but when we get to particular components like the hubs or particular programs, also think about what's the particular needs and goals and differences of those parts. So how do we have something that's both consistent um, and particular? You know, I think it's part of what we're also We've actually been in a world in which we've already become one, so that if you're working on behalf of children and families, you see yourselves as a part of a team that's contributing to what we do up with objects for others. But it isn't there yet. And so, I, I mean, I, that seems to me that on the ground. And somehow, we need to not feel badly about that, but we need to acknowledge it and be quite intentional about keeping bring, bringing us into more uh, agreement. Um, it's really agreement. We set up a funding system that rewards people for giving each other out at the legislature. And then we go to the hub level and say, you're all in this together. You all need <laughs> each other. Give me people off of your waiting list so I can serve them. I mean, you know, it's us, the policymakers, I think, that are pretty crazy. I mean, um, anyway, so somehow that feels like the world that, they're, that we're all living in. And, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't I think it's important to recognize people aren't behaving irrationally when they don't want to share. Right. Anybody else have anything on the phone uh, have any questions or comments? Let's see if it's the chat. Uh, this is and Debbie, this is and, Debbie and, and, and I just and really, I appreciate really appreciate what the last what person, person said. said. Uh, uh, I, I can't kind of tell by the by the go to meeting thing, but um, if there was applause button, I would be sharing it. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, oh, we got uh, Patricia. She said that. Uh, hi, Patricia. I can't. Hi. Hi. Were you having trouble hearing everyone, or? I am able to hear, yeah. Um, sometimes, I don't know, if, uh, for some reason it cuts off when some people are talking, but I am able to hear right now. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Nellie joined us, and we have a caller two and caller three, and uh, Ms. Harris just joined us in the room, too. Uh, so, Bobby, I also really appreciate the the two things the, the, the two big things that I think I heard you say. The, the the big goals with the baby steps. And I I think we all struggle with that in the whole early learning system work. And it's tough to manage the outside perception of what are you guys doing? <laughs> and then uh, the, the yeah, the that what you said about we've set up a system where it is a competition, but really we need to be a collaborative. Um, the, and then I was also looking at the questions. I didn't review them. 
I was like, oh yeah, um, these are familiar. <laughs> um, do we want to go through these and talk about them? Tom, do you want to take that discussion? And it might be good to also start with the three high-level categories before we get into the individual, just so people get a sense of that. Sure. So first of all, um, the goal was to come up with a set of learning policy decisions that can really help us kind of organize our thoughts around what we do in the early learning system to like kind of put some of that craziness into perspective and like, what are we all doing together. And so we set out, and I um, started a few months ago with the draft based on what other states do, and we fine-tuned it over time. And um, we've addressed what we see as uh, these big, big policy and research questions in three primary areas. They originally were oriented around the three main goals of the learning brain system. Kindergarten readiness, obviously, will pay system. They've been rephrased a little bit, so now we have that collaboration, access, and the impact on kids and families. So in developing these questions, we are trying to think about, okay, how can we keep it broad enough but relevant to all our work? And how can we use this to help orient us um, when we're trying to figure out these key questions? And so in developing these, um, you know, I don't know if I want to go through and read them all. Um, I'll just start out by saying I think the, that's a little bit of the purpose. I found them very useful, not just in helping us think about what we might want to research and evaluate or change, but also in help, it's helping me in um, developing data systems. So if we want to uh, answer these questions, how are we going to get the our data to address them. These aren't thought exercises. We want them also to be practical. So um, we have the three three primary questions, one for each section. For the first, on the impact on kids and families, which is kind of the big apple we want to uh, we want to consume. Um, are state-funded and affiliated services improving healthy development for young children and families? Furthest from opportunity. And so one of the reasons we're here is to get your input on saying where are gaps in equity to address key issues, or are they um, sufficiently implied or expressed um, in the various questions. And part of the goal for this exercise is also to have a pretty like succinct list that was sort of pretty manageable with the idea that when you're looking at any particular program or system, you know, these would have probably all need to get fleshed out into multiple different questions underneath each of this, but to have something that's pretty um, concrete, succinct, um, that can, you can sort of come back to as a um, point of departure. I don't think I would say that right. <laughs> So I wasn't really prepared to present. I, don't, I always feel dumb just reading questions when I do this. And I'll share how best to read the discussion. Facilitation is not my forte. <laughs> well, I'm also wondering if from any of the measuring success folks, if there was anything about the discussion that we had over these questions that you want to share with this group. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that each meeting we kind of revisited it, and um, I think I see it as my grounding point so that we all come up for our next couple of hours together. And I'm thinking about what we did last time together, what we're going to do this time. Again, the area, like the area of focus for the point of departure, and I would also echo. Um, like they're meant to be like thoughtful questions, but also practical questions for Jarvis. So then when you were talking about the equity rooms and um, mm -hmm. having the conversations before implementation, I really value the um, equity implementations committee's like thoughts and voice on the questions because we do come back to them regularly and we want to make sure we're not missing something or um, or heading a direction. Yeah. I think that the 
the key question definitely gets to it. Um, and then, uh, um, and then 1.4, are they delivered in culturally relevant manner? But I'm wondering, I don't, I'm not sure, like, is there, yeah, do we need to be asking something a little bit more specific in that? And I'm not quite sure what that would look like. So, um, I mean, I, I know I, like, there's a lot of key buzzwords we use in your right. phrases for this new opportunity, culturally relevant, and I, at least for me personally, those are the kind of phrases we need to kind of discuss. And we're, we're addressing it the way that you do and you think about it. Yeah. Right. Like, should we, well, I guess, I don't want to run into my office and go make a copy of ours. Uh, Question, the eight questions that we have um, to see how they kind of line up and overlap. I wish I'd done that so mostly, but I just didn't think about it until now. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll wait a minute to do that if somebody has, wants to give some input about. I have a question. Okay. Um, and is there is there a reason for using the phrase furthest from opportunity instead of calling out children of color, like instead of calling out specific populations that are a target for everybody? I think someone above my paper should answer that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, Carol. I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a phrase we use to, so that we would stop saying underserved sure. or uh, all of those, those sort of best phrases that can make people like children and family who don't have the opportunity to rely on sort of government service, you know, so yeah. that was the phrase that, that was a, that was the assets baseline that we switched to. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I'll say that and okay. list Latino, black, native, and Asian yeah. and just say that and then say who who specifically would mean when we say that. Yeah. And this this is Debbie. 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 I, if I could if chip I could, in, I, I think I remember I talking that. about this specifically. Um, because living in a, a rural uh, community and even some of our frontier ones that furthest also could include that actual, you know, travel uh, ha ha was a, a barrier for some of our families to try and get those services just because of they they were so far away from where they'd have to come into. So I think that was where we wanted to kind of include that also, if I am remembering correctly. So I guess that sounds to me like a access question mm -hmm. um, and from an equity perspective I feel like when we when we broaden the language too much we lose the accountability on, on racial equity right. um, so that would be my my feedback I know when I think about it this is by no means the official position is um, this is from opportunity to um, people of color racial ethnic groups um, financially. Oh, we got a message to ask for people to speak up. So um, we have one mic right here and one mic right there. So if you want to project to right there. <laughs> <laughs> At least the, the way I think about it is first from opportunity includes racial, um, ethnic groups, uh, financially, um, well, economically disadvantaged, I guess is the phrase, and developmentally delayed and disabled kids. I appreciate that comment about um, rural and, and uh, travel is a big access issue. I've never really thought of it from an opportunity perspective. I guess it is kind of wrapped up in that, in a way. I think language as well should be included in that, so it's different languages. Yeah. So maybe it, maybe it can end up one of the sub-questions in that culturally relevant, I don't know, but that's separate. Yeah. But how do we delineate, how do we keep the phrase, because I think it's important that we use the asset space, larger phrase when we're doing the work, but then how do we add in the category we're referring to? So, so I have a two, two thoughts. One, one is a sort of a document thought and one is a process, uh, sort of a process thought. Um, one would be just add a glossary to this document that's really key, that really explains, that has key definitions for terms. Um, I'm also wondering if 
criticism opportunity is such an important term that's used so often, actually having an official definition that's approved by the council um, might actually be important to you. So I had a thought about that. Um, for so many years, so many of us in communities have fought to make sure that people were very clear about who we're talking about. And this almost sounds like a retreat from that. You know, well, I work with different communities, and particularly the African American community. And people want it to be very clear with this particular issue, and I'm, I'm not talking about this, but if there's something we're working on, we're specifically referring to, um, like we talk about the discipline disparities. We look at what is the specific impact on African American children, and particularly African American males. And we want that to be very explicit. We don't want it couched in language that um, you're not very clear when you look at it who you're talking about. So the furthest from opportunity phrase does bother me because I, I don't I don't think that it um, speaks to looking at specific populations and it's like the woman who talked about the wool and the access. I mean, let's say it. What are we talking about? Even if it takes three lines, let's put it out there. So the EOD has spent a lot of time trying to come up with language that uh, is not, um, that, that, uh, strength based, I guess would be the best way to say it. And my, I haven't been a part of those but I thought that this language came out of that work. So I think I have questions for the Lillian here and, and Carol and whoever else worked in that. Can you walk us through briefly all that work that you've done to get us to asset-based language? And because I feel like we, you've done all this work, but I know this much about it, and I think some people in the room probably haven't been involved in it, and it feels like that would help us see all, um, see the picture more clearly. Do you have any history? I walked into this language, so okay. I don't have the history. <laughs> I don't have the history, and I also, and I also don't feel um, married to it. I feel really strongly that we, we should be beating around the bush, but I also. <laughs> Um, that's also above my pay grade, so I <laughs> I'm not a of package of, of package of language, but I'm an advocate for, and I appreciate the phrasing and how it helps encapsulate, and I support naming when we can name what we're specifically talking about. So I don't have I don't have the history on that. Oh, cool. um, do you did you have a question before we jump into that? I think that was the question, okay. wasn't it? I think just also because I'm a little bit newer to this committee, just like what what led up to this sort of language and you know, was there a point where it's, we said, when we talk about our equity goals, you know, do we know what those are when we say that list? And also, you know, what the decision has to be. So that, same question. Well, um, I guess for me also I walk into it this work <laughs> I but I know I know that we're gonna get that. Well I would not have a room with that <laughs> communication tool was developed, but it was developed by Shani Garcia from the uh, Chief Education Office, and her her and her team developed this toolkit around how do we shift not only the language but then also the conceptual understanding of different terms. Um, so just saying, like if we're still saying underserved youth, which has a negative like that could possibly be interpreted as um, trill something something's wrong with that child rather than we're talking about disparities that disproportionately impact children based on particular aspect of their identity, whether it's race, gender, um, SES, you know, those things. So that, that tool was meant to like also shift language, but shift also conceptual understanding of what we're talking about and how we're shifting away from a uh, possible blaming a child or a family rather than looking at systemic barriers that's impacting that child and that family. Um, so those were terms and ideas that were developed and piloted through the active space communication tool that was developed from the Chief Education Office for the work uh, for the state of Oregon. And the other part of that is that 
there's a group of communications, uh, there's a, a cross uh, education spectrum communications team that we, we sort of refer back to this assets based language package. Um, and this where we get to the can we define it? I think the answer is probably no, because we acknowledge as a group that the language keeps changing. So as we hear feedback and as we hear people wanting um, clarity, we just we just keep adjusting. Every once in a while, we sort of visit it quarterly and say, well, this is what higher ed saying now, and how does that fit into what ODE is saying? How does that fit into what um, ELD is saying? And so we we just keep growing it, right? So None, so I would say that none of this is necessarily set in stone, but we want to keep moving the bar further to make sure that we're as inclusionary as possible when we're talking about kids and their families. Yeah. So I guess I just want to say that I really I appreciate asset based strengths based and moving away from at risk and the labels that have been rejected by community for so long. So I think that's wonderful, and I guess. Maybe one way of thinking about it, or a recommendation to consider, would be to keep the key question with um, the words, you know, children and families further from opportunity. But then in the sub question, if we're really looking at how to how to measure success and have some accountability in the system for racial equity, then I would suggest in the sub questions calling out the specific groups that experience disparity that we want to see change, um, and asking ourselves, are we seeing change for this group? Are we seeing change for this group? I feel like they need to be separate questions because if when you lump it all together, you start to lose and you're not answering the question for each group that's experienced a disparity. Then if, if there's improvement for one group, you can you can check it off conceivably, you could check it off while other groups are still falling through the cracks. So I would like to see just some, some strengthened message around that. You know, when I look at that particular language, it doesn't seem to be important with the equity lens language far more explicit and powerful. So that, that, that was part of my thinking. And the other thing I wanted to just say, you know, a term like underserved youth for me does not point the finger at the youth. It points the finger at who is not providing the service, who is not meeting the needs of, of the child. Um, but I, and I, this just furthest from opportunity doesn't doesn't really grab what it is this should be about. I think it, 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 it's, it's lacking. It's almost watered down language. It kind of harkens back to the days when we used to say disadvantaged youth and you know all those kind of terms that just in the end don't provide the kind of um, explicit language. Yeah, I really appreciate those comments, especially with that metaphor of the equity lens, which is supposed to mean a sharp mm -hmm. focus mm -hmm. to solve a problem. And in yeah, broad terms, which we which we create to be inclusive, mm -hmm. then we have the opposite side of, of almost taking that laser focus off and looking at things very broadly. And like Sadie, I, I appreciate the fact that there was an, was an opportunity to try to use some language that was more strength-based as opposed to, you know, Jesus name, wishy-washy, but then in the end it still doesn't quite capture what I think is important to capture. And I think also when we're seeing multiple tools and seeing how they play out within group settings, um, I mean, for those who develop the tools, you, we may have the theoretical background, we have the particular definition, so we're going to bring those questions, particular terms, depending on like, what research base you're coming from, has a very distinct meaning to us. However, when, if these are going to be tools that we're going to be using or other groups will be using as a way of guiding, then I feel like in translation, those things are lost even when we have a glossary. For example, the Oregon Equity Lens. There's three parts of the Oregon Equity Lens. The belief statements, which called out all protected categories, the eight equity lens questions, and then a definition portion at the very end. And most of the time when we're utilizing the equity lens, we solely pull out the eight questions, um, and people or groups may or may not read those other, the actual lens, <laughs> which is the first part that helps you guide through those particular questions. So if we're creating documents in which people will probably naturally go to the particular questions to work through, 
um, that I think it lends us to really looking at how do we specifically call out what we're talking about to help guide and engage and interaction with the concepts and ideas that we're trying to get at um, without using some 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 of the language that we use. Because I mean, I know what <laughs> I know what it means. Um, I think many of us know what it means in the group. However, it loses that impact as it's you know moving uh, as we're utilizing it in different groups. And if we don't have a clear focus, because I think we can, I, I'm just going to speak for myself, um, I have my interpretation of what those terms mean. I don't know as a group we have more of what those definitions mean. So as a group, we're not moving in the same direction if we don't have those specific conversations. And looking at the complexity of a child, which means that we're looking at, um, we're looking at um, what composed of their identity, was it race, gender, sexual orientation, um, gender expression. You know, all these things, um, and those things have to be specific points of intersections that we're calling out when we're talking about the complexity of a child and utilizing these tools. So we just pulled up the equity ones just to, um, to show you all. The other the other thing that's uh, coming down the pipe really soon is uh, Lisa Perry on our staff is help, and, and I are helping to write um, institutional policy that shows staff how to use this lens when creating policy. It's hard to write that policy, <laughs> but we're trying. We've got it. We've got a draft down. We're hoping we can be done with it by the end of the year. But you're absolutely right, Ms. Joyce. This is this. These questions are more impactful, and and we're we're trying to get to a place where we have our team use these as they create as they're creating. So, Oakland, can you just ask me about the the terminology? I I think it's really important for us to be able to move on to talk about policy too, but the words in the policy are important. Um, one thing that I really like about the term for this opportunity is that it points out that we have said as a group that we want our focus to be not on just people who don't have as many opportunities as other people, but the people who actually have the least opportunity. So like if there's this set of children and they like they have a lot of opportunity and they hope things are really good and then there's another set outside of them that like some things could be better. I think we often spend a lot of time on this sort of, like people call it like the low hanging fruit. But what we've said as a group is that we want to spend a lot of our resources on the children who get this way out here. And so saying that for this opportunity focuses on let's make sure we're getting people way out here and bring them into this group as opposed to spending resources like close to the inner circle. Mm -hmm. just, I guess I'm just saying like the flip side, I'm trying to think of kind of devil's advocate, like what would be. Yeah, I understand that. I think that that term help, helps me remember overshooting for the people who get really the most. Right. I think that's how I read it too. I was like, well, I didn't like it, but I felt like it wasn't, I, I, I think that I, for me, I, I still have questions like, what do we mean by yeah. that? You know, is it physical? You know, geographical distance. Yeah. Is it you know uh, socioeconomic? Is it you know disabilities? And I think it's you know, is it racial disparities? Yes, it's all of that. And I think when uh, Mr. was talking about you know this is you know like calling it out and call it, you know it's a systemic thing. So for this opportunity, maybe we can say meaning you know uh, racial you know things that somehow to call out the you know, breaking the, the perpetual systemic racism, classism, you know, like, however we want to call it out so that it's easily defined for others. Like, we might get in because we talk it, talk that talk all the time, but I think from an outside point of view, what do we mean is important to call out. How do we do that? So, I it also, it makes me think also that a lot of what we're grappling with is, is the way that we all do interpret words and how to do this to take a couple of terms and have them mean the same thing to everyone. I think functionally what I'm watching, at least in the hub system, and it sounds like things like it's rolling out in other parts of the system, is this, that functionally we're having trainings. People are having conversations in their communities. So a lot of what we're talking about here is being defined across the state by those conversations, not a couple of words. So these words are really important to guide those conversations, but just to say that out loud, I think a lot of the definition and the way 
from where I sit, anybody watching the work happen, is really in those conversations that are happening right now, the assessments, the data coming to them, particular part. Oh, yeah, you're Chris, is it? Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. And, and the structural racism trainings that we're all getting ready to start. Uh, uh, we'll also, uh, as we're planning the agendas for those, uh, and thinking about you know our communities, doing the deeper dive into the data for our communities, and thinking about that collective impact model of everybody having that common language as we move this forward. So it's, that's exactly what's happening at the hub levels right now. Uh, so I just have sort of a process sort of question. This is sort of think about. Um, so both, both our committees are advisory to the council, to the council, the council is the decision making body. What's the question and discussion that you want the council to have and what are your thoughts about how to set up the council to have that discussion? So sort of, you know, sort of a bigger question, but just I think we're sort of putting on the table of what's how does this conversation get taken to the council in a useful and meaningful way so that they also have a chance to understand what the committee's grappling with. Well, I'll just say as a council member, I'd like to understand more. I think it's fascinating that neither of the two of you in your positions will part of the creation of the language. I assumed it was ELB, you know, but that just because well, I just two years, two years. Yeah. So I mean, we, I look right. at every year, and you're like a year and two months. Right. Yeah. So I, um, I would like, but, but what you were describing is that it's broader than ELB. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's broader than the council, although I don't know. The extent to which we are committed to working in concert with higher ed and community colleges. Well, I, I think we're in a really interesting and I think lucky space where this this whole education team from yeah. from us to higher ed is committed to focusing on equity, right? Which is something that is not happening um, to this degree in any other state you can see. And so, I think our commitment to one another, and I and I and I think that. ELD of the three is like, like we're on a sprint, like we're committed to this work, knowing that that's where the work starts and we want these kids to be ready to go to the K-12, the K confident and ready to learn. Um, and so for me it wasn't necessarily a, a, a detriment that I wasn't part of it, but I feel really lucky that it was there already and flexible so that we can come in and say, you know, we should really actually say black, brown, and native kids, and that folks respond to that, and that we will stop saying subgroup and just say group. Um, and so, uh, the, 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 the ability to be moveable with language in this process is really important, and I think the ability that for staff to be able to say, actually, this should say black and brown, and this is why is important. So I don't know, as a council member, I don't know if you think that's a decision point that you all should make, or if it's something you would rather have staff come in and say, this is after collective wisdom with OBE and tech and us and community and equity committee, we feel this is the way it should be. Well, what I was feeling is that as a minimum, before we as a council would ever do anything, I'd want to understand that. Right? Right. And I'd want to understand the power of all these people having really worked hard right. um, to think the harder than, than the rest of us have. I would like to know. Now, I don't know if the council would want to tweak it or change it. I know Pam always says the actual groups are actually named in the legislation. So that's really not negotiable for the urban council. They're named. Um, but how we talk about those groups and whether we name them how as in the individual groups or whatever, I think is all that. I'd like to start with the foundation of the work that is guiding you guys. And that, I have great respect for it. I've been kind of, you know, listening carefully for years to 
what you say and you know what I hear, but I personally don't have a solid um, grasp. I've certainly read the equity lens in every paper that comes out, but that's different than this operationalization, and that's personally, as one member, I would like to understand how you're operationalizing this in language. I think that, and Lily, I won't, I won't speak for you, but I think that, but your the ELC chart is pretty clear that it's a it's a race focus, um, which is heartening. Um, and I think that for me, just as you know, my, and as a person in the office who's sort of the language person, uh, we all know that black and brown and native kids are for this room opportunity, and that the and state functions have, have done them no good service for uh, decades and in a century or more. Um, and so to be able to put that link, so that's what guides the way that I create work. So I want to make sure that we're naming um, racial groups and economic disparity and rural separation as part of the language. So I don't know that it, the concept is, is more than that, but the work of it is hard to hard to And I think that's where Lillian is so vital to what we're doing is because it's hearts and minds change and the way that we sort of educate our team and the way they use language and why it's important that we we put those words directly into the things that we're doing. Yeah, for example, um, one, um, I was able to talk to the creators of the app and face like a tool um, and all the different tools that's been developed and utilized and what's like the cornerstone of all of them is this point of interest interaction between those who are using it and others in order to develop that collective knowledge and sets out these questions that we're posing in this group right now because again like we can put out I'm just gonna put it on the table we can create the best tool greatest glossary and if we do not provide that framework in order to help people engage with those and provide that kind of I call it I like to call it sandbox where people have like kind of a structured way of interacting and engaging then all of our work will be for naught and I do believe the tools that we are using and the conversation that we're having it helps structure the interaction that we need individuals to have in order to like build their capacity around the work and I think that's the what just say for example the asset based tools it was supposed to, it, it is meant to be flexible with the understanding that language is, it changes, it morphs, um, and having that conversation around it, not having like these like very strict, like, oh, here's the terms that we're using now, without that social political context, I think, like, um, works into that piece around interaction and what does that mean in operationalizing uh, these tools. What I'm, the, sort of my sense of what I'm sort of hearing from Bobby, though, is, However good the tools are for the recommendations around language practice, unless the folks, including the council, have a chance to sort of talk through them and grapple with them, they don't become fully living documents. So I think that's why I'm sort of feeling some need of how do you take this discussion to the council. Yeah, so um, I, I guess I'll be one of the answers. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, maybe we could request uh, at some point having a, a fuller discussion on the agenda. I know that I need to take our reworked uh, charter. Thank you. I was like, what's that word? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reworked charter to have this session. So maybe we can weave those two discussions or have those two discussions at the same time. You know, here's our reworked charter. Here's what we're hoping to, you know, to move, you know, for language for everybody not just the equity because if it's not if we we can have the greatest charter or we think that we have <laughs> <laughs> but if, if it's not you know if it, it, it you know and it's based on the lens it's supposed to be applied across the board and you know while we certainly are part of a, the the education system and we have to work with um, the education department and higher ed we can certainly set a standard So I'm wondering for that particular request, if there's like specific items like you would like outlined or discussed um, to help frame that conversation that we can bring to the council. Well, I think you just like we could say, we like we could say, yeah, like 
not generically, we, we understand, those of us at, at these various tables understand what we're talking about when we say furthest from opportunity, but how can we always be clear and call out exactly what we're doing so that it's always forefront in our mind? Like, so it's not, it, there's never a question or it's never lost, you know, from anybody who comes in brand new, what are we, who are we talking about for this from opportunity? Oh, we're talking about racial inequities, we're talking about socioeconomic, you know, uh, inequities, we're talking about how rural uh, versus uh, urban might play into that, you know, like, we're, we're talking about all of it. And I think that, <coughs> I agree with what you just said. We're trying to get rid of the ambiguity in that statement. Because until the person that called in talked about service from opportunity in geographic terms, how many of us thought about it that way? You know, I certainly know that rural children are often at a disadvantage just by the nature of where they're located. But to put it within the context of the equity lens, um, making sure that we're being equitable with all of our young people. I think that that's why it's important to be very explicit in the language that you use so that people understand, you know, that you're not leaving out the rural community and that there are other ways that they are also furthest from opportunity, you know, in addition to the geographic uh, distance. So I just think that what needs to be taken back to the council is, you know, maybe someone from the council who was there when these discussions were being had can shed light as to what, what were they thinking about. Um, and that brings me to another point. I know that I, I think there are supposed to be some council members who are assigned to this that are supposed to be a part. Is that you? Yeah, I'm on Council Bobby on the Council. Okay. I I thought that there was so there were some other people who were also. Yes, there are other people. Okay, who are, and they never hear. Right. And I'm going to just say that that is a disadvantage for us because when discussions like this come up, um, we got the new kids on the block who do an excellent job based on when and where they entered into this work. But it really is important to have the folks who were there, you know, grinding through all of this to be able to say, this is what we were thinking. And, oh, and we didn't even think about that. And so maybe it would have an impact both ways, informing us, but also providing them with um, some additional things to think about. Because so none of this is, you know, like, said it's not set in stone. None of this work is static. You have to constantly be upgrading it, refining it, making sure that it's relevant to what is going on, you know, with our populations, with our state, with ESSA and, and everything that's going on. So I hope that gets reflected in the minutes. Yeah. And it's recorded too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think also, I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this too, and I don't want it to become, well, we can't stop doing what we're doing because we're reworking our language. I think that we can continue on with the work as we make the language clearer. Um, and process-wise, I'm not going to a council meeting, so I don't know, but would it be appropriate for staff to bring a recommendation, to, like along with facilitating the question that questions or conversation like here's some recommended language based on that putting them in the don't you know we are already that be mm -hmm. a good way to start so that it's not just wide open again to have a really big broad conversation. I think I feel like at least from the equity committee I've got a pretty strong consensus about calling out who who those kids are. <laughs> my, my observation on the council is if you bring the council something that's a recommendation that they also need to act on to pay more attention than if it's just a discussion. So I think my, my process question is do we need council approval to be children? And yeah, obviously. 
No, I think the council is required to stay true to the legislature, okay. which lists. So we listed it's just we're doing what the legislature says. I know. I, this is only one person, but I mean we're not going to put on this way. But I think if you um, want this as an official policy from this committee, it has to go. What well, I don't I mean, that's not, I, mean, I don't think that's I don't think that's what I think the policy. I think just I think adding language to the work that you're doing. I don't know if that's what yeah. Well, I think this I think eventually needs to go to the council for official adoption as well. So I think if we bring anything to the council, it would be um, that higher ed or that law education groups toolkit. Is that what you called it, Lillian? Really? A toolkit. Right? Toolkit. But if that is an information item. I mean, we don't. I don't see why. Why would, unless the council were going to say something like, we did adopt the equity plan. If you wanted us to move further and say we also adopt the toolkit or something like that, it would work. So, but I don't think you want to deny yourself. Do you? I think that I think what I think what I'm hearing is that. And what you guys are asking, and tell me if I'm hearing this wrong. The equity loan is already adopted by the LC. Yes. We're just actually doing the work of reflecting it back into the work. So it's just, I don't imagine it would be any like stamp of it again. Right. It's just, right. we're just being more true to the lines that we have agreed to if we put language in this. I think what, I'll just speak for one person on the council. I don't think I understand enough background about the words we are choosing to use and why we're choosing to use them and the pros and cons of using a broad term and specific terms. But that's information. I don't think you do it. I don't think that I I have a shared understanding with Carol of we did the policy work. Um, but these words are going to appear in documents that we have to adopt. So would this part that so would this look like a series of like when we're thinking about council meeting, a series of opportunities for individuals around this table to come to present to the council concerning um, pieces of information to help deepen the council's knowledge around the processes that we're engaging in as a way to build that foundational piece and then also to update the work of the equity implementation committee. So again, we're pairing in these things with um, work that's being done um, throughout the year. It's hard to get on the council agenda because it's so big. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's always so cramped. Right. So I don't know I can do that idea, but we have to think what I wonder if what is possible. If in the introduction of this to the council, so we put the we, we do the language, right? It's it's for this opportunity and in the sub questions it's clear um, we're concerned about, you know, black, brown, Latino, native, Asian, right? We're very clear about that in sub questions. And then whomever is presenting this to the council when it comes time, they can maybe present with Eva and Eva can pop in and say, the reason it's so explicit is because we're hearing the equity lens and this is why. And that could be the piece of that we're not yeah. on the agenda, but we're saying this is how it works in tandem with the other committees. It could be the option. And you know, this discussion is not unique in terms of making sure that the documents that are created, the policies, is inclusive of the equity lens. You know, the equity lens has become you know, oh, yeah, we're doing the equity lens. And we ask the question, how? Often people can't answer that. Oh, well, we didn't have the belief statement. So, I mean, I, I'm co-chair of the House Bill 2016 African American Black Student um, Success Plan. I'm also on the ESSA Statewide Advisory Committee. And we're, we're having these discussions. I also was a part of the advisory committee that work with Darks and Kewan on developing the equity lens. And we were very clear that that document needed to be very clear to people so that people weren't um, confused about what the equity lens was about and who it was addressing in terms of 
of our system of education. And so now the, the big challenge is, I mean, we all clapped and Doris presented before the, the Senate. Uh, it, was, it was a glorious moment. But none of us were operating under the illusion that this was going to be easy work. Because it's always the implementation part. It's always making sure that people understood, you know, just what do I need to do and my sphere of influence to ensure that what is in that equity lens comes to fruition. And so I'm, I'm just saying that this is not something that's unique to just the discussion we're having here. People are always trying to figure out, you know, well, does this mean that we do this? Does this mean, or how do we do this? So, I mean, I think it's, it's an important discussion. And words are important because the words that we put out there should be understandable to all of our constituents. Mm -hmm. Community-based organizations shouldn't have to struggle to try to figure out and I think that's part of, I know that's what Zadie is probably concerned about, and many of us are concerned about making sure that everybody understands what this equity piece is all about, because we all have a role to play. Even the people who are being identified as furthest from opportunity, we all have a role to play, and we need to understand that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions, comments? I want to also acknowledge what uh, comments that others have made um, or ask them to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, there's been a lot of comments, <laughs> 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 um, including make sure we talk into the microphone. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Melly, you said something you were bringing up uh, experiences um, and that you like the idea of a glossary. Um, Patricia, we need to say underrepresented communities and that is total from that is total language from an equity lens. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, she's adding more. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. This Hi. is Patricia. This is Patricia. Um, yes. yes. We're talking We're right talking here about, about education. And I honestly feel that if we go to statistics and if we see who are the children that are furthest from, from opportunity, uh, it's definitely our children of color, African American, Latino, um, and we need to make sure that we include that language in there. Yeah. Oh, I see. Were you responding to Melly's uh, comment just before yours? Yes, I did. Okay, Melly, you can talk about that a little bit. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. OK, so um, my only concern is when we actually have our conversations, we know that there's disparity amongst all ethnicities, especially where I'm at on the coastline. Our school, elementary school, P3, you know, we're all title schools. And our highest population is Caucasian children. So we need to include, if we're going to have conversations where we're identifying ethnicity, we do need to include them all, not just only because we've you know, seen statistics that it's African American or, or Latino or Native American. We need to recognize, if we're going to say them all, we need to say them all. So I hear what you're saying, and I think what, you know, the equity, the equity point of view, when we talk about uh, furthest from opportunity, we know that, uh, um, to, to use uh, Carol's language, black, brown, and native children ha are, usually have a larger, dis they have a larger disparity than uh, white children. 
So we, but then when we're also talking about furthest from opportunity in a geographical sense that covers other, you know, and then the socio socioeconomic status. So it's, it's not an either or. It's we need to focus on this and then who amongst those groups are furthest from opportunity so that we can start to bring them closer into that opportunity. And so it's not an, an intention to exclude uh, white or Caucasian families and children. It's to be able to call out there is a greater disparity and inequity uh, for, for people of color. And, and non English speaking families too. I think we can say that as well. But it's all going right. to depend on your individual hubs where that where that is, and that's I think where it kind of that's the rub is how can you be all inclusive, and then also make sure that you know these other where it's maybe it's more based on socioeconomic, um, depending on where that is. So it just gets tricky to figure out how to do that unless maybe it is, you know, this could mean da 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 depending on your specific hub um, situation. Can I respond to that? <clears throat> um, I think that if we if we call out children of color, children living in poverty, children who are learning English, children who experience disability, I think they're very we can be very, very specific and not leave kids out who are far from opportunity. I think that Caucasian children as a whole, as a demographic, don't experience a disparity in education. But poor Caucasian kids, kids living in poverty, do. So I think that's where we need to be really clear about the language. Otherwise, it becomes all, and, and historically, and still, all does not include all. It's too watered down. So I think, absolutely, we don't want to leave kids behind who are experiencing a disparity. We just need to be clear about what the disparity is. Right. Tom, Tom, I'm wondering the data. Tom has been great about sending data to the hubs. Again, I think about the hubs. They're a great starter for all this work. Um, that really calls out the different uh, groups in mm -hmm. the school district, by school district catchment area. And from what we're seeing with the hubs, only one element of that is certainly to include location in the conversation, but to, in the language, to um, expect that all those different groups are careful with that in the data. Yeah. And that no one gets lost. Because isn't that the purpose? Right. Would that be helpful when we're thinking about languaging that? seems like functionally that's what's happening. Yeah. And I think, I guess, something that Els is coming to me as we're having these conversations um, is the importance of, like, when we're specifically calling out um, our, our um, students from different race and ethnicity groups, um, students impacted by poverty, students with disabilities, students that is English is not their primary language, um, or are learning English. It's really important for us, in my opinion, to specifically call those out because, again, when we're looking at the rates of disparities based on population, that's where we're seeing our numbers. And I think as, as an early learning system, as we're developing our data system to learn more about the individual learners that we're seeing, we also know once they hit the K-12 world, those disparities are, we're seeing them when we're thinking about kindergarten assessment data, or we're looking at third grade reading data, or looking at ultimately at graduation data, we're seeing very specifically where those disparities are lying, and it's not the point of excluding, you know, white children. I'm going to put it on the table. If we're not talking about excluding white children. We're talking about if we have to prioritize resources, which we know we have to do, because we are in a scarcity model of education, we don't have funding for every single child right. We're prioritizing resources. When we're prioritizing resources, how are we looking at children that are, um, are and disproportionately impacted by multiple systems within our education, within the early learning realm? And that's where those conversations come up when we're talking about particular groups. And again, it's never a conversation like we would exclude white children from receiving funding. I don't think that's the the conversation on the table. However, in our goal of specifically referencing those groups, 
Um, I do believe there is a tension point feeling as if we will leave out um, students that we identify as South Asian or white when we're having these conversations. So again, specifically calling out has never been about excluding or not thinking about, but if we're specifically calling out the disparity, like when we talk about poverty, we can say poverty. And for example, when the Chief Education Office submitted their chronic absenteeism report, um, they wanted to look at children. They know that children impacted by poverty are more likely to be um, absent from school or um, being chronically absent. So when they were specifically going across the state, they were just like, we are going to over um, identify children of color that are experiencing um, poverty that's also absent from school. Because if we just say poverty or social economic status, because of sheer population within the state, it's possible for us to have a sample size of individuals um, that can be homogeneous without um, having an opportunity of referencing or talking to other families that are disproportionately high, at a higher level experiencing absenteeism within their communities and within their schools. So again, I think as we're looking towards being you know, um, specific around how we're addressing these disparities that are impacting children, we have to be really specific about what we're talking about in order to get there. I just want to do a time check. Yeah, we've got, we've got, we've got, sorry, I have some on. No, that's no, right. <laughs> <laughs> we have 15 more minutes for the measuring success committee, so I know we've sort of got stuck right on one, which is really great. So, um, <laughs> if, if there's other cards that you want to run through in 15 minutes, I think it'd be great. And also, I think we can look Or you can keep talking about each piece, which is also Uh, so I kind of scrolled down earlier. Um, if we if we call out what we mean by furthest from opportunity um, in the first question, this, you know, and then reflected in the sub questions above, should we repeat that in the sub the question? You know, that that language is there in almost all the questions for access to early learning services. Mm -hmm. That's my, yeah, yeah, whatever you said, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was getting a clear alignment with the types of questions yes. that right. are being posed throughout this document um, when I, I did my first reading. And I think with the addition of kind of what we talked about, it would, you know, pull that out and require those who are interacting with this tool to specifically answer what does that look like. How are we doing it? How are we helping about that? Who are we accessing to get that information to do it culturally responsible? Yeah. I think some of the questions that I've been formulating after listening, I don't know how they would appear on the document yet or in each place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they happen in each place. But if, um, I appreciate all the conversations about you know, children for this opportunity, the pros and cons of naming mm -hmm. the children or keeping it open. Um, and I think a little bit about like what would it, what would it look like to say in the document each community in Oregon um, needs to be able to share how they use the equity lens to inform their definition of what children from service of opportunity is um, within their community. And knowing that I, I mean I know I came across at one point a glossary of words I feel like I'm a little new to the community. Okay, I remember seeing, so I was like, I kind of want, I wish I had that for me so I could see and look. Yeah. Um, but like, how is your community using the equity lens to help you inform and define in your community what children are for this opportunity is, and then what are you going to do about it? Because um, I think this is meant to be kind of, um, I, again, I'm new, and I really appreciate the pros and cons. This is, I thought that this was meant to be broad because each um, geographic area, each you know region in Oregon needs to have um, some level of autonomy, I think, to be able to define that for themselves and then what they're going to do to impact the children and parents in their community. But then having that go through each phase. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with repetition because uh, that helps me keep my framework in terms of like, okay, if I'm working on 
what does measuring success mean in access? And I like to look at that and see it all there. What does measuring success look like in coordination? I like to look at that and see it all there. I, I would just say that as part of the accountability and monitoring for hubs, hubs specifically not all engineering services, but in our world, we are moving towards asking those, I mean, they're required to specifically say these are children that are furthest from opportunity, here's the data that supports that, here's the disparities that we're seeing, here's the work that we're doing and the investments we're making with working with those populations, and then in our monitoring and accountability, specifically asking for the evidence that supports that that's what they are, what they're doing. And I think that some of the things that we're talking about, David, is we can contractually control as well in saying this is very clearly what it is that the state is saying. Because as Lillian writes, says, we're already our funding model is based on children in poverty. So the equity lens is the layover to that to say now here's where you have to identify what the disparities are and how you work with those populations. But we could certainly um, tighten that as we go forward in the next contracting period as well. And I think when we go through the monitoring this winter, it will be very telling as to where are people, where are hubs really at in doing that work and being true to the equity lens and, and what it is that we want. Anybody on the phone want to weigh in? So I just want to make sure I'm summarizing um, recommendations and next steps. Um, um, we'll go through the document um, and add much more specific language on who are the children that are being discussed at each mm -hmm. point. Um, when we take that to the Early Learning Council, it would also be really great to have some co-presentation of that from both the Measuring Success and Equity mm -hmm. Committee um, and really set up that conversation for the Council to have and maybe through the adoption of this document by the Council to have an opportunity to have that discussion. Does that seem like good in terms of next steps? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, unless, I mean, I don't know if folks want to take a look. You know, I also realize we haven't had a chance to go through the document in more detail. So uh, probably not, you know, the next 10 minutes, not to get too much more detail, but if, if, if folks have comments and want to share anything with the committee, they want to do that. Did you want to pull up any other specific, the charter or? Um, You know, we could, we could pull up the work plan, which I think is also, um... <laughs> oh, okay. 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 So, the, so the, this work plan is, this was a draft, as you can see from the date, this is May, and, you know, life changes, so I would say this work plan um, is fully accurate at this point. Um, but we also wanted to share it so that you as a committee um, could also help identify points uh, where we should um, be, again, working together or doing something sort of similar. Um, one of the things that's on here, but I think we'll have to move around for when it's on here, um, the Child and Family Wellbeing Measures Work Group. This is a work group of so Joy Community Health and Early Learning and some other folks produced a report about a year ago that had some recommendations that I think could really help us create some sort of high level, how do we measure progress of the early learning system as a whole. Um, and I think that would be a great, so I'm, I'm hoping that the Measuring Success Committee can return to that work and operationalize that work at some point. But I think that would also, just sort of thinking out loud, be a great also point of contact with this committee when that work starts to happen. It's a pretty full work <laughs> for the next year, and I know we have lots of stuff to add. So. But we also just wanted to share, make sure that you had it so we can help identify those important points of contact. 
I guess um, if you want, here are the two activities that I've led, like just early learning, like division groups through, where we're like looking at how do we utilize the equity lens for a particular body of work. So keeping with the intention of all the like the equity lens questions, but just say for the development of a policy or rules or something like that, we look at how do we craft that question to make it really tied to that particular body of work. Um, and that is an activity that I can support lead, lead through if that is a need for your group in order to kind of do that, because I've done that with other groups uh, within ODE and then DLD. And it's, it's helped kind of like land, like, okay, here's what this means for a policy, developing of a policy <laughs> in our space right now. That would be great. Is there anything else that anyone else from the committee wants to add? I saw your hand. <laughs> somebody, somebody has given us a message. Uh, show the documents on the on the oh, uh, Am I not sharing them anymore? Oh, your screen sharing. Oh, no, your screen sharing. Do you not see that document, Sally? I know the doc. It's I just see you guys um, with the camera on the participants. Oh, same thing for me. And same for me. Okay, does that work now? Sorry, yeah. I thought I thought I'd been sharing them the entire time. <laughs> I apologize. I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, so there. Uh, and these are all available if you go to OregonEarlyLearning.com uh, and I'll show you under Early Learning Council, Council Committees. And then you'll see all of the committees. So today, the materials for today are under Equity Implementation Committee and meeting materials for the date. And it'll take you to the Dropbox with all of them listed, so you can you can go back and review them. And I apologize, had a uh, I, I thought I was sharing them all along. It's okay, you're doing great. Someday it I'll get it. Up, it was up there initially, and then we just lost it for a little bit. Okay, okay. great. So yeah. You should all be able to find them online, too. Uh, any other questions, comments? Thanks, everybody, for being here. This was really, uh, I thought it was a good discussion. Looking forward to Yeah. So, yeah, so we just need the equity members to stay? Or oh, we can see, you guys can stay, too, if you yeah. want to hear some infant to toddler, wait, zero to three infant toddler assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I mean, <laughs> I would like to do very measuring success uh, related. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you're welcome to stay if you have other things to do. Uh, you stay Oh, hello everyone. I'm Elizabeth Underwood. I'm one of the very newest members of the Early Learning Commission. So, um, you all are old timers. I have been here since July and was hired in a limited duration position to help healthy families, particularly around the McCree project. So, in those McCree sites. Um, but I'm here today because uh, I want to share with you a tool that um, the Early Learning Division would like to implement. And um, basically, uh, this tool is called the Zero Degree self Statewide Self-Assessment Tool, looking at everything from policies to funding streams to data around infant toddler and systems, services, and really asking questions around those issues. There's uh, a lot of uh, data points to collect and some narrative to write about that, specifically looking at disparities. Um, there are stakeholder surveys, uh, 
to talk to stakeholders and get their input on their perspective on these policies and other items. And there's a family survey to take to families as well. So it's a big document and it has four sections to look at input toddler services in terms of um, really um, family support, in terms of early learning experiences and good health, and then the fourth section is around collaboration and system building. So um, initially, the attention towards this tool came because we got a federal grant, um, actually that was written by Don Woods and somebody at Teaching Research, um, and for some TA around infant toddler state systems. Um, and that really, the intention of that small grant was really to look at input toddler services in terms of updating the QRIS standards, as well as, and then through that, um, that sort of TA opportunity, a peer learning group was formed, and they uh, participated in some educational pieces that were offered from, through this grant, as well as were introduced to this tool. Turns out this tool has been around for a little bit, and uh, has been of interest to folks at the ELD for a little while. Um, but you know, the ELD would like to move forward with completing this assessment to really look at uh, what's, where the gaps are, um, where do we need to grow, uh, what goals do we need to prioritize, how, how are we ready for any emerging funding opportunities, um, and um, be ready in terms of just having that knowledge and that information available um, so this tool was inter actually went to Best Beginnings in September, and they're interested in assigning a work group to work on this tool. Um, so I think um, this grant with the peer learning group is now kind of concluding, and the peer learning group took a little dip into this tool, uh, actually with Tom's help, um, was collecting some data points and um, looking at the uh, looking at some of the process it might take and introducing it to best beginnings. And now we're kind of at a point where we'd like to uh, commit to working on it and maybe prioritizing certain pieces of it. Um, and I'm kind of at this threshold right now where it needs to, uh, best beginnings is ready to take ownership of it and sort of start to work with it. And I think um, I wanted to make sure we knew about that this was happening. And for my own learning, um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to give you some very brilliant conversation today, but a really rich conversation that had me reflecting about uh, the conversations I have with others around implementing the equity lens in the process of setting up work groups, in the process of reaching out to stakeholders, speaking to families, and um, in particular, helping people find language and what language they want to use in these conversations. So I'm, um, I am not a great thinker, but I am a good learner. So I'm kind of here because I would like to know from you um, kind of maybe I could sort of narrow it down three to five things that I need to be really attending to in terms of starting a whole process of implementation. Because I'm new, and I'm new to this. Um, I'm new to the equity lens, for that matter. Um, and also think about maybe giving some input for designing a work team. Um, and how do we really use this whole process as a way to engage with communities of color and realize that how do we make this a rich process? Um, so maybe we can just look through um, one piece of it. I think maybe I said I mean, Melly did ask the question. She sure. said, uh, has the document been shared with the Oregon Infant Mental Health Association and our collaborative groups? Not yet. I'm hoping that um, to, to get your input about who should be on the work group okay. as it's being launched. I do know that Oregon Health Association um, is interested in having Lori Theodore as part of the group, so she's pretty pretty plugged into all of that. Was the uh, was your question in regards to I mean before 
the work group runs with it, the development of the work group to implement this? Is it the ever view from that particular group or feedback from that group? Nelly, did you catch Lillian's question? No, no, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I said, um, from Elizabeth's um, answer, I was wondering if it was an ask for that to be reviewed by, or like um, reviewed by that particular association before the work group starts or as a member of the work group that's implementing it. Um, well, either, either or. Currently, I am an advisor for the Oregon Infant Mental Health Association, along with um, eight other women who were the first infant mental health um, endorsed specialist for Oregon. So I can get names. We could, you know, I could share with this with them. I could share what you'd like me to share with them and include them, however you see fit. Um, I've seen. Um, zero to three's document before. I'm familiar with it as well as the new endorsed infant mental health providers uh, for the state. So it's all really up to you guys what you want to do. But I, I think it would be beneficial to have them contribute. Yeah. I'm curious if, if in terms of you say you're familiar with the tool, can you speak more to that a little bit? Well, in the emphasis it is, um, you know, it is a big organization, of course, um, and each state has taken aspects of this and included into their um, handbook for their mental health associations. So lo a lot of what I'm seeing here is reiterated in each state's booklet of information, and Oregon has a new one that has just been done in July of this year, and when the whole process went about endorsing the new eight infant mental health specialist. Um, as far as questions that are stated here, these are all, they're all wonderful questions and they, they suit the document really well. Um, where it says about infant toddlers in the state, that would be really beneficial to collaborate with the organization of, of Oregon so that way you could have current data on that aspect. Uh, you're talking about the Oregon Infant Mental Health Association. Yes. Right. Right. So you wanted to go over one specific area? You were starting to say that before. We could. If that would be helpful. Um, just to kind of dig into just a little bit more. Um, maybe we could look at positive early learning experiences. Okay. Thanks. 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 Yeah. It works. <laughs> <laughs> That's very helpful. So um, this section really focuses on policies supporting access to quality of child care, early head start, early intervention, um, learning and development, and helping prepare children for success in school. So then, you know, um, can you scroll down just a little bit? It launches into um, some data questions and data points that, and a national comparison of those. And um, it's pretty difficult for us to read here, but um, what I'm, what Tom and has also pointed me to and others is that the data on um, racial disparities in the zero to three population is, is, is hard to find um, outside, uh, yeah, outside of uh, very kind of general data. Um, hub data that would be used to hubs, for example, that kind of real specific data. Um, we, you know. We are easily able to take a dive into. Um, did I frame that correctly, Tom, or do you want to say more to that? No, that's correct. You mean about the availability of data? Right. Yeah, I mean, we struggle, at least in the early learning world that I'm part of, um, with good, getting good local data on um, certain groups in the state just based on their numbers. So our, really, our best data source um, is probably the census bureau. They don't do a very good job with zero to three, certainly without zero to five. Yeah, it's usually zero to five, oh, kind of. Yeah, there, there's, there's some find. little data by year, but there's One not. Day break. What about cramps? Is that a non-useful? Hmm? Cramps? Really cramps is a 
uh, um, yeah, I can transition. I'll see. But it, it's, uh, I'm, for instance, the child care is limited because of the who the sample is. But uh, there's a lot in the cram staff. That's fancy. That's of course, I have to look at it. Okay, at the birth of the baby, a parent completes some information, and then two, in the baby's two, they're surveyed at that. And we have two time points on the same family. Is that right? That's more than I can say. Is no. it only certain families? That it's, it's not all? or is it off, like, are there, is there a certain demographic that completes the survey, or is it everybody? I wish I could remember. It's been years since I've been I just Googled it. I have a few years it was a survey. In Google. Uh, <laughs> so it's through the CDC? No, no. Well, because it's that's that there's an Oregon version okay. um, that the Oregon Health Authority does. Mm -hmm. So the CDC says CRAMS pregnancy risk assessment monitoring system is a surveillance surveillance project. Yeah, I said that word. <laughs> <laughs> Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and state health departments developed in 1987. CRAMS collects state-specific population-based data on maternal attitudes and experiences before, during, and shortly after pregnancy. Cramps, sur yeah, that word again, uh, surveillance, I, can't, I don't know why, why I have that problem with the word today. It uh, currently covers about 83% of all U.S. births. Cramps uh, provides data not available from other sources. These data can be used to identify groups of women and infants at high risk for health problems, to monitor changes in health status, and to measure progress towards goals in improving health of mothers and infants. CRAMS data are used by researchers to investigate emerging issues in the field of reproductive health and by state and local governments to plan and review programs and policies aimed at reducing health problems among mothers and babies. Did it say frequency? I want to think it's not every year. But. It's, I thought uh, every four maybe. It's every two or four. Mm -hmm. So the data get a little dated. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But you know, as you, as you may be aware, there is a very concerted effort to develop and integrate yeah. our data systems and begin to collect key demographic data to help us make those kind of decisions. Um, and we hope we get there sometime in the century. <laughs> <laughs> You just not talk about frequency. It gives uh, years that data are available, that the data is available. And I think you can skip this video off. Yeah. So after the pregnant thing. But it's hot. So um, maybe we can scroll down a little farther again. This is great. You can see better. So I have, I have a question. Yeah. So for uh, the implementation of this, like, to it or for a uh, yeah. process. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a state level process that individuals from the state will be collecting data, plugging it into this form, and then getting an output from it. The data piece, yes. Okay. That portion of it. Mm -hmm. So I guess like I guess a process wise, can you explain the different portions of this? So sure. there's a data piece, there's a, yeah. yeah. So the data the collection of data points I think is I, I, there, there's some of the Good Health section that um, came from actually Charlie's first. Um, um, so, but um, the data collection piece I would expect to be done by staff and um, with the resources that we have. And then um, following that, there are sections in the, um, you can include comments. So the work group will be looking at these and also trying to to take a bit more of a dive into some of the disparities, the racial disparities particularly. And then um, the next sections, uh, there is always, each section always has a stakeholder survey. So a set of questions that would go out to groups who are, um, here we go, does your state have policies? Um, this section, nope, continue, keep going, let's keep going. And we'll get down to the stakeholder section here. Mm -hmm. 
that to, to be completed by statewide document. Right. 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 Yeah. Yes. So this is around, uh, this, is, this section refers to really the funding streams and federal or state funding for these items. And what sort of through the, the tool really does is saying, you know, what are best practices is the wrong word because that's a technical term, but what are sort of the best policies, the most uh, infotogra friendly policies, funding streams um, that a state can have. And so it's looking at the, these initiatives and sort of as being the, the gold standard, if you will. State allocates funding to initiatives to promote rural language and literacy and so forth, yes, in, in Oregon. Um, and uh, some more comments and detail on the right-hand side. So each of these sections about funding um, would be, you know, could, could be completed by a group, the work group essentially reaching out to stakeholders or simply looking within the state system to find the answers. Are these your comments? These comments are um, initial comments, right? That we put in. Mm -hmm. Sample comments? Right. They're just initial comments. We want to add to them and refine them. They were kind of like the first draft of what people started responding to when they looked at the data. So, Ellie just had a comment about uh, in order to obtain data, especially due to the questions posed, this might be something that can be collected by early child care providers since they're implementing ages and stages. Mm -hmm. um, family baby events occurring at hospitals and uh, so she's just giving other groups. groups mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Melly. I'm trying to catch the comments as they come in. <laughs> Be a flash. Well, we because the meeting is recording, mm -hmm. it records the comments. It records too. everything, yeah. Then okay. It works the voice in it. Okay, great. So, um, further, um, in addition, then if you continue down the line, there are sections that are um, keep going. If you keep scrolling, you'll see that there are sections that are just um, this is a stakeholder survey. Ah, so. Um, these would be distributed to key people, key groups, to not necessarily as a survey monkey. I don't think we're thinking that's the most effective way to reach folks, but um, but these questions could be bundled together or prioritized so that they could be, conversations could be held and we could collect good information. I think there's still some question whether this format of none, some, most, yes, all, don't know is really the most effective way to stimulate getting good information. But, um, but it really looks at all aspects of child care and stakeholders' impressions of that. So it's more subjective. Certainly the comments are, would, would be very helpful to have. So uh, I can think of so many groups that would be interested in taking the survey. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. Yeah. I mean, I mean, some of them probably you know, Children's Institute or Children First. Um, I imagine that another organization would be Family Forward. Um, and then, of course, any. I think there would be a lot of providers too, varying levels and um, types that would probably be interested in weighing in on some of these questions around policies and programs and, and you know. So how would you make sure that we're really applying the equity in this thing? You know, this good conversation. So yeah. that, so getting the best information to move that forward. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, casting that wide net with, like, cause I, are you trying to get somebody, like, that is a point person for an organization? Are you trying to get members of organizations? Are you trying to get individuals that, I think you know, want to balance it. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, I think, you know, you ask, and, and, you know, and I don't, you know, if, do you want to only invite specific people to do it, or do you pass the wide net and ask anybody interested to, to, to do it? And then you ask uh, organizations to share it with their members. 
and you know maybe in that way a survey monkey might be a good way to catch some information and maybe some people getting forms too. I was going to say Lillian has already said that she's worked with groups you know specific to how to apply the equity lens so that might be something that I might pursue if I do maybe have some conversation with Lillian. And I think I would also suggest um, Annie Manning, um, her team of engagement specialists um, in the division created um, mm -hmm. our principles are, uh, around culturally responsive community engagement mm -hmm. and also the culturally responsive community engagement tool, which is an articulation of the equity lens within like engaging our stakeholders around community engagement pieces. I think that would be a, a great, um, those two documents would be a great thing to, um, to start with um, as engaging with this because it, it will help you walk through that process of like, okay, who's our stakeholders? Um, who are we specifically trying to call out? And it, it just walks you through the process and it also asks you to attach evidence of what you're doing. So again, it's that piece around the interaction between the, here's our principles, here's what we want to do, uh, we'll be able to land that in. So. Do you think, oh sorry, let me jump in. Uh, do you think that we would be able to provide it in other languages too, or would that have to go through like a validation process? You know, if it's translated, does it have to be? I, I, um, I mean, I think there may be situations where these questions are asked in community group discussion as opposed to like a, a piece of paper. Thing. So um, we would have the opportunity to offer these conversations in another language. I want to give some thought just up front on how you're planning on presenting the data at the end because you know, since it's not going to be a random sample, right, and you're specifically asking groups, do you lump all the information together? But if you had like 12 group advocacy groups and four families, you know, what does that mean when you aggregate that together? Do you want to report it out by specific categories at the end? And then you should probably figure out up front if you're going to do that. Like, are you going to group all the advocates and all the providers together and their responses? So I think you want to make sure you know how you want to present the data at the end before you start sending it out. Thank you for helping. Uh, Nellie also just provided more names and numbers that oh, we'll be able to get to you. Through the recording. Thank you. That's great, really. Well, group that you might tap into would be all the different um, focus networks and talking about the system. Um, through the arm mental health services, they are across languages also. So you have a group that's already meeting for every couple weeks. Uh, few, next few months just engaging the work group and um, 
you know, doing our initial mapping of what the process might look like, might, and then um, work on a lot of surveys and data collection in the winter, and then hopefully one day have a report. But along the way, it would be great to be able to come back and check it. And I think just another point of process um, with your question around like kind of the implementation of the equity lens. Yeah. I see the equity lens being used in kind of two capacities. One, the development process, and then also just the, um, the implementation process of, um, of, of, this, of this piece. So I think one, when, um, when you're coming back to us, what I would like to see is kind of like from the equity, like the eight equity lens questions, kind of um, once your whichever group starts this, that those questions need to be answered. Um, and then also in tandem with community engagement and things of that nature, so that when you're coming back to us, you're going back to that document so we can see, like, we can then, what's the progress? Um, where are the points of support? Um, so again, as you're utilizing the equity lens, it becomes that, that normie document, like, okay, are we on track with this? And so, here's the evidence to prove it, you know, here's the area where we need additional support, and I'd love to engage in that conversation with you as well. So, and just one thought I have, um, when we talk about zero to three, is who, who sees that population? And, um, they are predominantly with um, their own families, whether it be not just their family directly. Um, they're, very, they're really not in the system to the extent that three and four year olds are. So health sees them and with sees them. And then the very important groups that we, you know, if you're working with home, you see, see them. But it feels like if there's I'm not sure of the focus still, mm -hmm. but if we're talking about all of our little you know, ones and their families, then there are some audiences that are critically important because they're the only ones who see these people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the early learning community, we really don't see very many of them, the percentage Um so are you talking about child, child care specifically? <laughs> home visiting sees a really important targeted group, and mm -hmm. home visiting that happens in all the different places it happens. Right. Um, but WIC, is, WIC does a pretty darn good job of reaching a lot. So it seems like WIC is pretty important. Mm -hmm. But they feel important. And of course, health sees them. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, health sees almost all of them. And now with the CCOs. So I'm not sure what, our, what your priorities are, but in terms of who's in touch with where these families go, who has relationships with them, that it seems like we know already who they are. Thank you. So if I may, upon reflection, think of some other particular outreach. If it's okay with you, I might contact Carol and get in touch with any one of you to just kind of follow up around a particular connection or resources or something. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> yeah, we have to discuss next meeting. We can look at the calendar really quick to see if our uh, oh yes, Ruth wants us to pick a pick a location. Pick a pick location. Is that the uh, we're going to be on the 15th of November. I'll look really quick. While she's looking the, um, for the November meeting, we have on the on the schedule the child care research and referral contract. So Don Woods or someone from her team, or Don Woods and someone from our team, will come and um, make sure that the contract is reflects obviously our question from all of the equity and has keep our commitment to bringing those things first before they get done and then we have to fix well, fix it or feel frustrated. Um, are there any other items you want to see at that meeting? Or are, are we still on track with what we're planning on? I'm curious where things are moving with the uh, workforce development conversation we had last time and would it be the right time to revisit the development of that? Um, of the efficient development legislative concepts? Mm -hmm. um, 
can I ask that we don't talk about the workforce development at the next meeting because I will not be able to be at the next meeting because I'm in the work for the child resource center. Oh, so I need to introduce myself to come to that next meeting, and I would really love to be part of the workforce development conversation because I work in <laughs> you know, I know. And, and to be honest, I don't think there's actually been really much movement in that conversation since then, and there probably won't be much movement until after the election when we know sort of which budget reality we're in. So maybe in December we could look at it before it gets final. That'd be great. Everyone's going to see CCR in our control room, and I was just asking if there's any other another topic or another. Folks who want to be here from the next meeting, but it can just be all contract field, so all this flexible. I think you should take both those You think so? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other policy decisions coming up for the council that we should be aware of before? I was trying to think, I guess what I was just trying to think about too. Yeah. Maybe we can see if there's some partner organizations that are bringing some legislative topics that would be willing to share. Yeah, weren't you talking to Deanna about some of the world of things that you should have done for next meeting? Yeah, well, it is, uh, it is, um, I don't think the report that I am so inspiring on that editors um, will be completely ready, but we'll, uh, I think <laughs> a draft will be available to share at that point. Well, let's just call it other legislation and then we can yeah. formalize it in up the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone have any other comments or anything? Yeah, I think the time we're like in one minute. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this going if this would be a topic for next meeting or maybe after. Um, but there's been multiple mentions of ESSA in general. Um, how does that impact early learning? And I'm wondering if that would be a topic for this to see if we get identified by what we be to come present on what does that mean? I, I was talking, is that the reauthorization? Yes. In my head I went there, but I was like, maybe I should ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have one comment here. Um, oh, home visiting. <laughs> we'll do that, we'll put the home visiting in the pro develop, develop, wow, professional <laughs> development um, in the December. Was it when it's so yeah. all of it? Okay. And then we'll put ESSA in November if you want to identify who that person is. I'm not quite sure. Um, okay. But we'll put a placeholder for that person. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Oh. Oh. Not a, a, the, this room is not available November 15th. So it's Teresa or Erica. We'll just have to work on a, a location. I'm guessing it's probably at the health department and where we always end up. Unless you want to do it at Education Northwest. I can do it at like Education Northwest, but far from it's not oh, um, ideal. Because well, you're downtown, it's not complimentary. I mean, you can park at the small town. That's all you want to do. So, yeah, we could, I could. I mean, folks have to pay at the county, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. We have to pay the rent. And we have to pay and the anxiety of trying to find a place. Okay. Well, let's just have it at your place. Okay, I will we'll check when I get to the office okay. to make sure I can get the, um, we got quite a few spenders. Okay. And it's November 15th? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Everyone is awesome.